Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, October 26, 2022. President Joe Biden meets with Israel's President Isaac Herzog at the White House, with elections in both countries coming up over the next two weeks. One topic in the meeting, Iran supplying armed drones to Russia to use in its war against Ukraine. And now the White House says that Russia may be advising Iran on suppressing mass protests in Iran following the death of a young woman in custody of Iran's morality police. U.S. election campaign debates will have it for U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania, Republican Mehmet Oz, facing Democrat John Fetterman from Tuesday night, asked about what makes them qualified to serve. And also from Tuesday night for New York Governor, Democratic incumbent Kathy Hochul meets Republican challenger Lee Zeldin talking about fighting crime. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau announces steps to limit banks from charging overdraft fees, part of a broader Biden administration initiative against what they call junk fees, hidden costs found in cable bills, airline tickets, and hotel reservations and the like. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito on the impact of the leak of his draft opinion in the case that would go on in the final decision to overturn Roe v. Wade abortion rights. And we'll hear from the new British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in his first Prime Minister's Questions in the British House of Commons. Now to the White House Oval Office, President Joe Biden meeting with the Israeli President Isaac Herzog, President Herzog's first visit to the U.S. since assuming office in 2021. Israel does have a parliamentary form of government led by a prime minister, so the position of president is the head of state, largely ceremonial. The two leaders talking about a new agreement between Israel and Lebanon, also Iran's involvement in Russia's war against Ukraine, and in the case of President Herzog, also talking about a climate change. This runs about six minutes. President Biden begins. Mr. President, welcome. It's great to have you here in the Oval Office. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you for your hospitality you showed me when I was in Israel. And thank you again for the honor you showed me. I was bragging to the President. I have presented, been presented by the President, the Israeli Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is on the table behind you over there. I'm very proud of it. And but thank you for that honor. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Israel and Lebanon are going to sign an agreement to establish a permanent, a permanent maritime boundary between your two countries. I think it's a historic breakthrough. It took a lot of courage for you to step up and step into it. It took some real guts, and I think it uh, took uh, principle and persistent diplomacy to get it done. And I compliment you, and I compliment the government. This agreement is going to allow the development of energy fields and for both countries, and it's going to create new hope and economic opportunities for, for the people of Lebanon, enhance the stability and security of the people of Israel, in my view. I've been, as you probably know, I've been working on this since I was Vice President of the United States, and I really uh, compliment you. We're also going to discuss the ironclad commitment, and this is, I'll say this 5,000 times in my career, the ironclad commitment the United States has to Israel based on our principles, our ideas, our values, they're the same values. And uh, I, uh, I've often said, Mr. President, if there, uh, were, if there were not an Israel, we'd have to invent one. Um, Thank you. And I told you before, my dad was a, a righteous Christian who uh, we used to sit for dinner to have conversation and incidentally eat. And I remember even when I was a teenager, my dad talking about how we should have done so much more. Why didn't we bomb the railroad tracks? Why didn't we and so on? World War II. World War II. And uh, so uh, it's a deep shared concern. And so uh, we have bedrock values and interests, and I'm going to hope we get to talk about those a little bit today. And I think our interests are pretty uh, consistent around the world and in the region. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank you wholeheartedly for your hospitality, for inviting me here. It's an expression of true friendship. Uh, and we had the enormous pleasure of hosting you at the President's home and in Israel at large a few weeks ago. It was a true moment of pleasure for the people of Israel. And I also think it was one hell of a pleasure for you, too, as far as I could get it. Um, you are a true friend of Israel, Mr. President, and the United States is our closest, strongest historical ally. 
and I'm very proud to come here as the head of state of the State of Israel to express my feelings of friendship and bonding and uh, the unbreakable bond between our nations. You know, Mr. President, today marks 40 days to the killing of Mahsa, a young Iranian woman who protested and Today, the Iranian regime is crushing thousands of Iranian citizens, men, young men and women, who are demonstrating and simply pleading to have their own liberties. And this is a, an example of the way Iran is working, crushing its own citizens, moving towards nuclear weapons, and supplying uh, lethal weapons that are killing innocent citizens in Ukraine. And I think the Iranian challenge will be a major challenge as which we will be discussing. I want to thank you, Mr. President, and the administration for moving forward and carving the deal between Israel and Lebanon on the maritime borders. And we appreciate the effort and, and of course, the bringing it to fruition tomorrow. We will also be discussing the inclusion and integration of Israel in the region, in the Middle East as we see more and more nations coming on board and cooperating with Israel in so many fields. For one item that you and I will participate together with uh, leaders from all over the world in the COP27 in, down in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt a few weeks down the road, I think the climate change challenge can serve as a common denominator for so many nations and also between Israel and the United States. And finally, Mr. President, you know, we have elections in Israel, and you are having midterm elections in the United States. But one thing is clear, and I think this visit epitomizes it best, is that our friendship and strong bond transcends all political differences and opinions and parties. And I hope that together we can continue to work towards the well-being of the State of Israel, the United States, and the world at large. Thank you very much. White House Oval Office, President Joe Biden hosting Israel's President Isaac Herzog. The questions at the end from the reporters not answered by either of the leaders. President Herzog finishing up a two-day visit to Washington, D.C. He also had meetings with the Secretary of State Antony Blinken and U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and a policy discussion with the think tank Atlantic Council, which C-SPAN covered. You can find that full video at our website, cspan.org. And Speaker Pelosi and the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer sending a letter to President Herzog today inviting him to address a joint meeting of Congress as Israel prepares to celebrate its 75th anniversary of its founding. That would be on May 14th, 2023. No date set yet for the speech to Congress. An article at Axios says of today's White House meeting, it comes less than a week before the Israeli elections, and the Biden administration has expressed concerns that if opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu wins the elections and forms a right-wing government, it will include Jewish supremacist politicians. And in such a situation, President Herzog will become an even more critical player in the U.S.-Israel relationship. President Herzog bringing up the military drones Iran sending to Russia to use in Ukraine at the regular White House briefing with reporters this afternoon, the White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre saying that Russia may be helping Iran in return. It has been uh, 40 days since the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in the custody of Iran's so-called morality police. We join her family and the Iranian people for a day of mourning and reflection. The president said it at the UN General Assembly, and it remains true, quote, we stand with the brave citizens and the brave women of Iran who right now are demonstrating to secure their basic rights, end quote. We are concerned that Moscow may be advising Tehran on best practices 
to manage protests, drawing on Russia's extensive experience in suppressing open demonstrations, the evidence that Iran is helping Russia rage its war against Ukraine is clear and it is public. And Iran and Russia are growing closer the more isolated they become. Our message to Iran is very, very clear. Stop killing your people and stop sending weapons to Russia to kill Ukrainians. We remain committed to ensuring that those responsible for the brutal crackdown on those courageous protesters are held accountable. Today, we are announcing a joint action between the State and Treasury Departments, designating 14 individuals and three entities using five different authorities, demonstrating our commitment to use all appropriate tools to hold all level of the Iranian government to account. Specifically, we are designating Iranian government officials who hold leadership positions within Iran's police and prison systems and who are responsible for or complicit in serious human rights abuses. We are designating the governor of the province of Sistan and Balochistan for his role in overseeing the violent response by security forces against peaceful protesters. We are designating individuals who are actively serve as commanders in the IRGC for their brutal response to protesters. And we are designating two entities involved in censorship, surveillance, and malicious cyber activity against the Iranian people. The United States stands with Iran, Iranian women and with all the citizens of Iran who are inspiring the world with their bravery. The White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, an opening statement at today's regular briefing with reporters in the White House briefing room. A spokesman for the Kremlin, Dmitry Peskov, telling reporters today that Russia will continue to make the case that Ukraine intends to detonate a radioactive dirty bomb. It's a claim that the U.S. and Ukraine and many other Western countries says is completely false. Dmitry Peskov saying, we have information that suggests Ukraine is preparing for such a terrorist sabotage, and we will vigorously continue to convey our point of view to the world community in order to encourage them to take active steps to prevent such irresponsible behavior. Reaction to this ongoing issue from the White House, the National Security Council Strategic Communications Coordinator John Kirby joining today's briefing. On the uh, dirty bomb allegations that Moscow is making, I'm wondering if you can walk us through some of the potential scenarios that the U.S. sees here. Um, as it relates to Russia potentially <laughs> planning or executing a false flag operation, do you anticipate that it's that they will use the mere threat of a dirty bomb by Ukraine as an excuse to retaliate with a tactical nuclear weapon? Or do you anticipate that they would actually deploy a dirty bomb themselves, blame Ukraine, and then use a tactical nuclear weapon? How does the U.S. see Yeah, let me start the question at what I would normally do at the back end, and that's to say that we haven't seen any indications that the Russians are making preparations for the use of a dirty bomb, or quite frankly, the, the, the use of tactical nuclear weapons. I think that's important to get right out front. It is a common uh, Russian play for them to blame others for what they are doing themselves or about to do themselves, which is why we took it very seriously when the Russian defense minister called the secretary of defense and said that they had information that the Ukrainians were, were, were fixing to, to, uh, to use a dirty bomb. So obviously, it's a false allegation. That's not true. The Ukrainians have nothing like that in mind. Uh, they have no intention to do that. So that's why we take that's why we take it seriously. Now, the question you're asking is, are they just using the threat of it, or are they actually doing? It? Again, we've not seen any indications that they're making any preps to do that. I wish I could get inside the Russian mindset here and tell you exactly what they're thinking with respect to uh, why they put this out there. I, I can't do that. All I can do is tell you. We took it seriously. We've spoken about it publicly. We're monitoring it as best we can, as best we can. Uh, and uh, we're going to make sure that we can continue to do what we have to do to help Ukraine defend itself. So are you preparing for both of those scenarios? We are making sure that Ukraine can defend itself against the range of threats that the Russians are posing inside Ukraine. And I think I'm going to leave it there. And lastly, um, do you, you made clear that Russia using a tactical nuclear weapon would be crossing a very significant line. 
Do you view the use of a dirty bomb as crossing that same line? The use of a dirty bomb would would uh, uh, cause uh, would would cause significant casualties, depending on the size of it, and, and certainly uh, follow-on uh, casualties as well from radiation exposure. Um, it, I'm, I'm not going to classify it one way or the other, except to say that it would be yet another example of Russia's brutality on the Ukrainian people, um, a, another level of atrocity. If they were to do it, uh, that, uh, that would have to be dealt with and, and, properly, uh, and, and they would have to be properly held account, accountable for it. John Kirby is a spokesperson for the National Security Council, speaking to reporters in the White House briefing room. Also today from Associated Press, the Kremlin on Wednesday kept the door open for talks on a possible swap involving jailed U.S. basketball star Brittany Griner, but reiterated that any such discussions must be kept strictly confidential. A Russian court on Tuesday rejected Brittany Griner's appeal against her nine-year prison sentence for drug possession. President Biden also meeting with his Defense Department leaders today discussing world events, including those by and in Russia and Iran, and also China president commenting on U.S.-China relations since this past weekend's conclusion of the China Communist Party National Congress that saw the President Xi Jinping get a third five-year term and solidify his authority. President Biden saying that the U.S. would continue to lead on a number of issues, from Russia's aggression in Ukraine to climate change to the Indo-Pacific region. And he says uh, of China, we do not see conflict with them, and President Xi knows this. This is Washington Today. Now to U.S. election campaigns and the battle for control of the House, Senate, and the governor's mansions. In the race for U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania, Republican nominee Mehmet Oz debating Democratic nominee John Fetterman Tuesday night in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's the only scheduled debate between the two before the November 8th elections, a contest that most polls rate as a toss-up. Mr. Fetterman, we're going to begin with you. Your political experience includes serving as the mayor of Braddock, a small borough near Pittsburgh, and one term as lieutenant governor. You're running for a seat that could decide the balance of power in Washington. What qualifies you to be a U.S. senator? You have 60 seconds. Hi. Good night, everybody. I'm running to serve Pennsylvania. He's running to use Pennsylvania. Here's a man that spent more than $20 million of his own money to try to buy that seat. I'm also having to talk about something called the Oz rule, that if he's on TV, he's lying. He did that during his career on his TV show. He's done that during his campaign about lying about our record here. And he's also lying probably during this debate. And let's also talk about the elephant in the room. I had a stroke. He's never let me forget that. And I might miss some words during this debate, mush two words together, but it knocked me down, but I'm going to keep coming back up. And this campaign is all about, to me, is about fighting for everyone in Pennsylvania that ever got knocked down that needs to get back up and fighting for all forgotten communities all across Pennsylvania that also got knocked down that needs to keep get back up. Thank you very much, Mr. Federman. Mr. Oz, you are a doctor, a businessman, and television personality. But this is your first run for elected office. What qualifies you to be a U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania? You have 60 seconds. I'm running for the U.S. Senate because Washington keeps getting it wrong with extreme positions. I want to bring civility, balance, all the things that you want to see because you've been telling it to me on the campaign trail. And by doing that, we can bring us together in a way that has not been done of late. Democrats, Republicans talking to each other. John Fetterman takes everything to an extreme, and those extreme positions hurt us all. Let's take crime as an example because it's been such a big problem. Maureen Faulkner accompanied me today to the studio. You know that her husband was a police officer in Philadelphia. He was brutally murdered. John Fetterman, during this crime wave, has been trying to get as many murderers convicted and sentenced to life in prison out of jail as possible, including people who are similar to the man who murdered her husband. He does it without the, with the rest of the pro board agreeing. He's doing it without the families on board. These radical positions extend beyond crime to wanting to legalize all drugs, to open the border, uh, to, to raising our taxes. I want Washington to be civil again. Well, you need it to be less radical. John Fetterman, unfortunately, okay. would bring that. Mr. Oz, thank you. Pennsylvania Senate debate from Tuesday night. Mehmet Oz, the Republican, John Fetterman, the Democrat. In Harrisburg, 
the audio from the host, WHTM-TV. This is an open seat as Republican Senator Pat Toomey decided not to run for re-election. Democrats have controlled the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House and the White House for the last two years, united government as it's called. If Republicans win control of the Senate and or House after the elections in a couple of weeks, it becomes a divided government. How might things change? An analysis today from Norm Ornstein, senior fellow emeritus at the American Enterprise Institute. It's hard to imagine a circumstance now where Democrats hold on to the House of Representatives and the Senate is uh, in the balance. Now let's talk a little bit about the consequences. And here again, I fault the media because it's all horse race or all about uh, John Fetterman's stroke. And it's not about what these elections actually mean. And there's even very little about what the candidates are saying or what they stand for. One thing we know, however, is as 538.com has pointed out, at least 126 Republican candidates for the House with a 95% plus chance of winning are election deniers. Almost 300 Republican candidates for the House, the Senate, governorships, attorneys general positions, and secretary of state positions, a substantial majority of all those candidates are election deniers. Now, that doesn't just mean that they're narrowly focused on whether 2020 was won by Joe Biden or won by Donald Trump. It's a template for a kind of radical populist attitude. And that means that the Republican majority in the House is going to have a substantial majority of its own members who fit into that category. And that means that when we look at what will be divided government, almost certainly, and we'll talk about the Senate uh, in a, a minute, it means we're headed for extremely difficult times. Now we can look at an analogy. The analogy is the uh, 2011 Congress coming in after the disastrous 2010 election for Democrats. The Tea Party surge coming in. And we know that that Tea Party surge was abetted and encouraged by the three Republican leaders uh, at the time who called themselves the Young Guns, Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy, Eric Cantor. And we know that right from the get-go, they planned a confrontation with Barack Obama over the debt ceiling with a series of demands. And we came dangerously close to going into default. And if it weren't for, and that was really egged on by Kevin McCarthy and uh, Eric Cantor, if it weren't for John Boehner and Mitch McConnell, who saw, I think in Boehner's case, that this would be a disaster for the country, in McConnell's case, that it would be a disaster for Republicans, who were still trying to recapture a majority in the Senate, pulled us back from the brink. We came close enough to breaching the debt ceiling that interest rates actually went up and was estimated by economic consultants a few years later, it probably cost an extra $18 billion uh, to the federal government because of just simply the threat of that happening. And the biggest question mark we have heading into next year is, will we get a repeat of that? And I would say we will get a repeat, except we will come much, much closer to the abyss. Norman Ornstein is a senior fellow emeritus with the American Enterprise Institute at an AEI panel discussion today on the midterm elections. His biography at the AEI website says that he has been studying politics, elections, and the U.S. Congress for more than four decades. In addition to the races for the House and the Senate, there are also three dozen states holding gubernatorial elections on November 8th. And in New York, Democratic incumbent Kathy Hochul is facing Republican challenger Congressman Lee Zeldin. Governor Hochul took office in August of 2021 following the resignation of Democratic Governor Andrew Cuomo. New York Times reports that for months, Governor Kathy Hochul has trusted that the state's strong Democratic majority would keep her in office largely on the strength of a simple message. Her Republican opponent was too close to Donald J. Trump and would roll back abortion rights. But just two weeks before Election Day, a rapidly tightening contest has Ms. Hochul racing to expand her closing argument, as Democrats warily concede they might have misjudged powerful fears 
driving the electorate, particularly around crime. That reporting from the New York Times. Here's an exchange about crime from last night's debate between Kathy Hochul and Lee Zeldin held at Pace University in New York City. First question is going to go to you, Mr. Zeldin, since you won our drawing this morning. Crime and public safety are one of the top issues in this race. You've promised, if elected, to invoke a state of emergency on crime and suspend several laws, including bail reform measures, in order to improve public safety. But our state's Division of Criminal Justice Services, which tracks statistics, says that it's too early to draw conclusions, pointing out that in 2019, prior to bail reform, the rate of rearrests of people out on bail in New York City was roughly 19 percent and remained statistically the same at around 20 percent in 2021 after bail reform. DCJS, this division, of course, maintains the DNA database, administers the sex offender registry and the missing persons clearinghouse. My question is, if you become governor, would you make policy despite the agency's findings? Well, listen, you ask the will of the people. They want to see reform. Even Mayor Adams says that judges should have discretion to weigh dangerousness. I don't think that if you're two Mexican cartel drug smugglers busted with $1.2 million worth of crystal meth, that you should just be instantly released on cashless bail. Now, Kathy Ockel supports cashless bail. As soon as it got implemented, she was out there bragging about it. She chose the champion of the defund the police movement and the architect of cashless bail, Brian Benjamin. Yeah, that guy who got arrested and had to resign. That was her first big decision to make him the lieutenant governor. We need to repeal cashless bail. We need to repeal the HALT Act. Amend raise the age and less is more. We need to make our streets safe again. I'm running to take back our streets and to support unapologetically our men and women in law enforcement. Enforcement. This is about all of us together, Republicans, Democrats, independents, as New Yorkers, to make sure our streets are safe again, to make sure our subways are safe again. This is our opportunity. Two weeks from tonight, we can continue with the status quo where they believe they haven't passed enough pro-criminal laws, or we could take control of our destiny and make sure law-abiding New Yorkers are in charge of our streets again. Okay. I'll give you a chance to respond, Mrs. Hochul. Well, I'd be happy to. First of all, you can either work on keeping people scared or you can focus on keeping them safe. I have worked hard to have real policies that are making a difference. And as you mentioned, that data is still being collected. But I did focus on bail reform in our budget. That's why the budget was nine days late, because I insisted on common sense changes. But there is no crime fighting plan if it doesn't include guns, illegal guns, and you refuse to talk about how we can do so much more. You didn't even show up for votes in Washington when a bipartisan group of enlightened legislators voted for an assault weapon ban. I mean, we lost another child and a teacher yesterday in St. Louis because people will not support what I was able to get done here in New York, and that is a ban on assault weapons for teenagers. You can't even do that. It's, it's quite extraordinary, but it's about getting the guns off the streets. That's the first start. We have more to do, but I'm the one to do it. Did you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I, unfortunately, Kathy Hochul believes that the only crimes that are being committed are these crimes with guns. And you, you have people who are afraid of being pushed in front of oncoming subway cars. They're being stabbed, beaten to death on the street with hammers. Go talk to the Asian American community and how it's impact them with the loss of lives. Jewish people targeted with raw, violent anti-Semitism on our streets. It just happened yet again. We need to be talking about all of these other crimes, but instead, Kathy Hochul's too busy patting herself on the back. Job well done. No, actually, right now, there should be a special session. The state legislature legislature should come back and they should overhaul cashless bail and these other pro-criminal laws with zero tolerance. But they're saying, elect me. She says, elect me. And then you'll find out where maybe I'll stand on this issue in January. Congressman Lee Zeldin, Republican from New York, the Republican nominee for governor of New York, debating the incumbent Democrat Kathy Hochul at Peace University, New York City, Tuesday night. It was hosted by Spectrum News, at New York One. The Cook Political Report with Amy Walter does have this race still as solid Democrat. Early voting started this week in New York. The director of the White House Office of Drug Control Policy, Dr. Raul Gupta, interviewed today about opioids and fentanyl and the more than 100,000 Americans who died in 2021 from drug overdoses. It was hosted by the Washington Post. What health threats keep you up at night? Well, as I mentioned before, the opening of uh, this, this synthetic drug systems is, is really opened a Pandora's box. We, this nation, this world has never, ever seen a threat that you can create in a small place 
and, and literally be imaginative in nature and get to it. We're in a very different stage in the world. Um, and it is that which is very important. Our systems have been, you know, we've had the tools of the 20th century oftentimes that we try to apply in 21st century in so many areas. This is one area we cannot afford to do so. So it's a matter of just making sure that we're building 21st century tools because the threat has never been greater or never had been more severe. Um, so it's really important for us to not only be looking at emerging threats from drugs, but at the same time, providing people the help and the care that they need and building that tre addiction treatment infrastructure while making sure we have policies that are compassionate, caring, and evidence-driven. Dr. Raul Gupta is director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, a position also known as the White House Drug Czar, interviewed by Washington Post Associate Editor Jonathan Capehart. Dr. Gupta also applauding President Biden's recent pardon of people who have committed federal marijuana possession offenses. And when asked whether it is a step towards decriminalizing cannabis, he said this is a certainly a step that the president believes deeply in. He believes that people should not be arrested or convicted for sole possession or use of marijuana. And he said it's part of the administration's efforts to look at our justice policies from an equity lens. Washington Today continues in a moment. C-SPAN Radio Live Campaign 2022 debates continue Thursday. At noon Eastern, New Hampshire Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat, faces Republican candidate Don Bulldog. And at 8 p.m. Eastern, Illinois' Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth debates Republican Kathy Salvi. Also live Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, some Republican and Democratic women in Congress who are retiring talk about why they're not running for re-election. This event is hosted by Politico. Listen to C-SPAN Radio anywhere on the C-SPAN Now app or on your smart device. Say, play C-SPAN Radio. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now app. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is taking some steps to restrict fees that banks charge account holders for overdrafts and also for checks they deposit that end up bouncing. CFPB says almost three quarters of overdraft fees are paid by people who are charged over 10 times a year. And usually those people have no more than a few hundred dollars in their accounts. Bloomberg News writes this is an issue that's gained political resonance ahead of the November 8th midterm elections. And the White House is looking to address voter concerns about spiraling costs ahead of the midterms, which will determine whether Democrats maintain control of Congress. The CFPB director is Rohit Chopra. He joined President Biden at today's announcement. This morning, the CFPB announced more actions to combat illegal and unexpected junk fees, one on surprise overdraft fees and another on surprise depositor fees. We're putting companies on notice about their obligations under law. We're taking enforcement actions, like one against a large bank for charging illegal overdraft fees, and customers will see hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds. We also sued a payments company for cramming $300 million in extra fees on families who were just trying to sign up their kids for YMCA camps or we're just registering for a charity walkathon in their community. And we're going to continue by finding ways to reduce burdens of other fees, like the billions in penalties charged by banks and credit card companies through new rules and guidance. This is real money back in the pockets of American families. It's good for them and it's good for businesses that follow the law. Rohit Chopra is director of CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, speaking in the EEOB, Eisenhower Executive Office Building, alongside President Biden. President Biden said that today's announcement part of a bigger effort to deal with what he calls junk fees, hidden costs, also charged by airlines, hotels, Internet and cell phone service providers and others. President Biden, during his remarks today, putting this into a larger context, he says he appreciates the frustration the American people feel during this time of high inflation. One of the things that I think frustrates the American people 
is they know the world's in a bit of disarray. They know that um, Putin's war has imposed an awful lot of strains on Europe and the rest of the world and the United States, everything from blocking grain shipments to oil. And, um, and they want to know, what are we doing? And uh, there's a lot going on that we're doing. And they add, it adds up. And what I'm going to be coming back to you with is an example. I don't know if I'm going to do it from a podium or a, a release. But take an average family and, who's going to go visit their mother or father for Thanksgiving. What, what, what's, the, what's the charge? Are they going to come home from school? I mean, there's a lot of money. These are billions of dollars. It doesn't add up to billions for the individual, but it adds up to two, three, four hundred bucks for average families. And I'm not being solicitous here. I say to the press here, a lot of you come from backgrounds like I came from. We're not poor, just regular folks. But that matters. It matters in their life. President Biden today in the Eisenhower Executive Office building right next to the White House. Also on the economy today, Congressman David Rouse, a Republican from North Carolina, tweeting a one-minute video. It's part of an agenda that House Republicans are running on in this year's elections, looking to gain enough seats in the U.S. House to get a majority. They call it commitment to America. Joe Biden and House Democrats' wasteful government spending and flawed economic policies have caused inflation to skyrocket to the highest rate in 40 years, with no end in sight. Families across the country and right here in North Carolina are paying more for everything. School supplies, groceries, you name it. High prices at the pump and steep increases in energy bills to heat and cool their homes make it that much worse. Americans can't afford Democrats' policies, but we're certainly paying for them. House Republicans will fight this inflation crisis by reining in out-of-control spending and bringing stability to the economy by passing pro-growth tax and deregulatory policies that will allow each and every American that wants to work the opportunity to live the American dream and prosper. This is our commitment to America. Video posted by Congressman David Rouser, Republican from North Carolina. Wall Street today, the Dow up two, NASDAQ down 228, S&P down 28. Federal Reserve's interest rate increases this year to deal with high inflation having an effect on the housing market. The Census Bureau is saying today that sales of new family, single-family homes fell in September 10.9 percent to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of just over 600,000 units. And the Mortgage Bankers Association says the average interest rate on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is now 7.16 percent. That's up four percentage points in a year, and it's the highest level since 2001. Vice President Kamala Harris today announcing a billion dollars in federal grants for clean school buses, mostly electric. 2,500 of of them in nearly 400 school districts around the U.S., including tribal areas and territories. Vice President Harris was in Seattle. Who doesn't love a yellow school bus, right? Can you raise your hand if you love a yellow school bus, right? Just, there's something about... And and most of us, many of us, went to school on the yellow school bus, right? And it's part of of our our experience growing up. It's part of, you know, a nostalgia and a memory of, of the excitement and joy of going to school, to be with your favorite teacher, to be with your best friends, and to learn. The school bus takes us there. And in America... Today, 25 million children a day go to school on the yellow school bus. 25 million children a day. And today, 95% of our school buses are fueled with diesel fuel, which contributes to very serious conditions that are about health and about the ability to learn. So when I think about what the experience should be for our children of going to school on the school bus, I think about the fact that it should be about maximizing that experience for them, 
understanding that this bus symbolizes so much about our collective investment in our future. Because of course it is about our investment in our children, in their health, and in their education. And in that way, our electric school bus program really does represent an intersection of all those points. Vice President Kamala Harris in Seattle, standing in front of three electric school buses made by three different companies at Lumen Field. Joined there by the EPA Administrator Michael Regan. EPA says that it received about 2,000 applications requesting nearly $4 billion for more than 12,000 buses, mostly electric. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito says that the the leak earlier this year of his draft opinion in the case that when the final decision was issued weeks later overturned Roe v. Wade's abortion rights made him, that is the leak made him and other justices, targets for assassination. The final decision was six to three. Voting in the majority was Justice Alito, Justices Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch and Clarence Thomas and Chief Justice John Roberts. Justice Alito speaking about this Tuesday night at a program hosted by the Heritage Foundation. So one of the most remarkable features about the court in an age of incessant leaks uh, is the confidentiality that long covered its internal deliberations. Unfortunately, uh, that changed this last term with the horrific and completely unprecedented leak of your draft majority opinion in Dobbs. Uh, How has the leak affected the court? It was a grave betrayal of trust by somebody. And it uh, was a shock because nothing like that had happened in the past. So it certainly changed the atmosphere at the court for the remainder of, of last term. The leak also made those of us who were thought to be in the majority in support of overruling Roe and Casey targets for assassination because it gave people a rational reason to think they could prevent that from happening by killing one of us. And we know that a a man has been charged with attempting to kill Justice Kavanaugh. It's a pending case, so I won't say anything more about that. Uh, But, that was last term. Um, now we're, we're in a new term. I think that all of us want to, all of the justices, and I think the people who work in the building, we have a wonderful staff, um, I'll add that, want things to get back to normal uh, the way they were before all this last term, before COVID, get back to normal to the greatest degree possible. And uh, that's what we hope will happen. And I think. Everybody is working on that. You know, during my 16 years on the court, the justices have always gotten along very well on a personal level. I think the public, when they read our opinions, probably misses that. Um, We sometimes, you can see by reading those opinions, we sometimes disagree pretty passionately about the law. And we have not, in recent years, been all that restrained about the terms in which we express our our disagreement. I, I'm as guilty as others probably on this on this score. But um, none of that is personal. And that is something that I think I wish the public understood. Yeah, I know you have to try to get along. There's a very prominent lawyer who's here in the audience. I'm going to steal his line. He said that uh, you may be life tenured, but I'm sure at times it seems like a life sentence. And I'm sure that's, <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Interview with Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito with John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation, that audio coming from the Heritage Foundation YouTube page. The Supreme Court on Monday is set to hear a a case that CNN writes they'll take on two hugely consequential cases concerning whether universities and colleges can continue to take race into consideration as a factor for admissions in order to improve diversity. The audio of that case will be fed. We'll have it on the C-SPAN networks. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, on his second day in office, leading the majority Conservative Party, taking part in his first Prime Minister's Question Time in the House of Commons. He was welcomed by the opposition leader, Keir Starmer, of the Labour Party, and then it was down to the questions. First one, about a cabinet member, the Home Secretary Suella Braverman, 
who resigned or was fired, depending upon who you asked, last week by the former Prime Minister Liz Truss and is now back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may I welcome the Prime Minister. The first British Asian Prime Minister is a significant moment in our national story. And it's a reminder that for all the challenges we face as a country, Britain is a place where people of all races and all beliefs can fulfil their dreams. That's not true in every country, and many, didn't, and many didn't think that they would live to see the day when it would be true here. It's part of what makes us all so proud to be British. Yeah. Was his Home Secretary right to resign last week for a breach of security? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Ronald Gentleman for, for his kind and indeed generous uh, welcome to the dispatch box. I look forward to Prime Minister's question time with him, and I know that we will have, no doubt, robust exchanges, but I hope that they can also be serious and grown up. So I look forward to that. Well, uh, he he asked uh, about the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised that. She raised the matter, and she accepted her mistake. And that's why why I was delighted to welcome back into a united cabinet that brings experience stability to the heart of government. And let me tell you, Mr Speaker, what the Home Secretary will be focused on. She'll be focused on cracking down on criminals, on defending our borders, while the party opposite remains soft on crime and in favour of unlimited immigration. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Yesterday, the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and promised integrity, professionalism and accountability. But then, with his first act, he appointed a Home Secretary who was sacked by his predecessor a week ago for deliberately pinging around sensitive Home Office documents from her personal account. Far from soft on crime, I ran the Crown Prosecution Service for five years. with Home Secretaries to take on terrorists and serious organised crime. And I know firsthand how important it is that we have a Home Secretary whose integrity and professionalism are beyond question. So, have officials raised concerns about his decision to appoint her? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I just addressed the issue with the Home Secretary, but but he, uh, he talked about fighting crime, I would hope, I would hope, Mr Speaker, I would hope that he would welcome, I would hope, I would hope that as we look forward, he would welcome the news today that there are over 15,000 new police officers on our street. And the, and the Home Secretary will be supporting them to tackle burglaries. Well, the party opposite, the party opposite will be backing the lunatic protesting fringe that are stopping pro- working people going about their lives. Yes, Starmer. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I listened carefully. That was clearly not a no. We can all see what's happened here. He's so weak, he's done a grubby deal exactly. trading national security because he was scared to lose another leadership election. There's a new Tory at the top, but as always with them, party first. Yep. Country second. Yeah. Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons in London. That's the Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer, the opposition, and the new British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, from the Conservative Party, also known as the Tories. The first Prime Minister's question time for him. It's second day on the job. Reuters reports that he is delaying announcement of an economic and budget plan until November 17th, two and a half weeks later than previously planned. A royal tradition continuing in Great Britain. The Twitter site at Royal Family tweeting a video of this bagpiper playing and writing His Majesty's Pipe Major played for the first time in the Clarence House Garden this morning. It was on Tuesday. As the king woke up in residence, the position was created by Queen Victoria in 1843, and Queen Elizabeth enjoyed the special tradition following her accession to the throne in 1952. 
Thank you for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get more of Washington's top stories sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.